Little wonder people cling so fiercely to stereotypes. These days, the mass media is crucial in interpolating people in contemporary societies, which is why governments and plutocrats strive to ensure their, its control. And uh, i just give you an example. Bali, uh, all these are going to be available as slides uh, uh, on the presentation. You don't need to clip the screen. Um, uh, Balinese dance and theatre consists of wall-to-wall -wall fantasy. If anybody looks seriously, this famous dance, Le Gong, dates at the earliest properly from the 1930s, not 2,000 years ago. Okay, arguing as argumentation, reasoning, and discussion. What do I mean here by argue and argument? In everyday English, the words include reasoning, deducing, inducing, discussing, deliberating, debating, expatiating, narrating, persuading, even reflecting privately. Every time we talk things over, chat, muse on what to do, listen to radio or TV, or even gossip, we are arguing. Kinds range from political speeches and negotiations to legal deliberation or the myriad forms of decision making. It includes how we narrate history or tell stories, to theater, film, television, everyday work, recreational and family discussion. Quite apart from that, we are endlessly bombarded with argument through the mass and social media, even if we fail to appreciate it as such. It takes some effort to find occasions when we are not engaged in argument. If people spend so much of their time arguing, why is it not a major topic of discussion? Unfortunately, anything to do with argument comes wrapped up in a European hegemony. Although there are non-European philosophies, European standards dominate academic thinking. Just think of uh, your own training. Others' practices is judged by how far it deviates from an ideal I uh, traceable back notionally to Aristotle over 2,000 years ago. Few philosophers consider other traditions even worth discussing. Formal accounts of reason have little to do, however, with, however, with the great variety of socially recognized styles of arguing. What a culturally ideal, acceptable, disapproved, disapproved or prohibited ways of speaking, acting, and judging others. What kind of criteria do people use to understand one another in different contexts? Why should we omit non-discursive forms like art, dance, and music? As we saw, images can be highly persuasive. But how culturally specific are such claims? And what styles of argument do different societies recognize? There are differences between formal reflection on reasoning, developed in South Asia and the Arab world, and informal conventions of judging what people say. What happens when they overlap? Many Southeast Asian societies have local cultural styles and all also great philosophical traditions linked to Nyaya Vaisesika, Samkhya, Buddhism, Christianity, or Islam. It would be convenient if the elite practiced a great tradition and common folks a little tradition. Certainly in Bali, it doesn't pan out that way. To my surprise, I discovered the more reflective Balinese villagers would use classical Nyaya Vaisesika reasoning in daily conversation. Imposing blanket categories is not going to work. Two obvious problems arise. First, how do we address the double discursivity involved in inquiring into argument? Presumably, we need analytical frameworks that are sensitive to local styles. Second, what kinds of argumentation are we investigating? One important genre is too extensive to discuss here, namely narration in historical or literary works as read or performed. Just how complex matters are in the Malay world alone emerges from, say, Errington on parapraxis, uh, in Hikayat, Sweeney on orality and literacy, or Becker's exploration of space-time and causation in Javanese shadow theater. Here, I confine myself to styles of reasoning broadly conceived. Now, an argument can be logically correct, but counterfactual. So, as a simple starting point, it is helpful to distinguish uh, styles of reasoning from the presuppositions that are invoked. The literature on Asian rhetoric tends to confine itself to reasoning in ancient India and China, uh, in formal settings. As far as I know, no one has addressed indigenous criteria of argument in detail. Surprising if it's so general. What, if anything, can we usefully adapt from the classical Greek sources which distinguish logic, dialectic, and rhetoric? So, 
these are European terms, and we are going to have to need to rethink them and consider how people use them. We have to start somewhere. Religious or theological discourse depends on deplying logic. Legal and deliberative institutions frequently use dialectic. Social life, and so what concerns, uh, mostly concerns in Southeast Asia, widely involves rhetoric. Every time you encourage, exhort, try to influence or persuade others, you're using rhetorical techniques. I'm doing that here now. These vary from employing reason or invoking imagination to appealing to emotion. Styles of rhetoric vary greatly in, say, Indonesia, from Sukarno's oratory to the Perinta Alus, the refined commandment. Here I quote Ben Anderson, who is a magnificent example of Orientalism, but never mind. You might ask, what has this to do with rhetoric if we understand it as bombastic oratory? What counts as effective ways of engaging and persuading people is clearly cultural. An interesting further discussion is between three modes of persuasion. These are ethos, how trustworthy the speaker is. So you see, if I'm introduced as Professor Hobart, you think I might know something. If you're introduced as that bloke who used to be the cleaner until yesterday, you get rather more suspicious. So ethos is uh, quietly quite important. Secondly, logos, the logical reasoning used, and pathos, the emotional effect created by the speaker or text upon spectators or readers. Uh, the um, uh, Eisenstein clips uh, are an example, I think, of pathos. As the Javanese example above suggests, refinement and self-command are a crucial part of the ethos of trustworthiness. Not losing your temper and doing things in a refined manner, not that Prabowo was very good at it, um, uh, seem to get the point across. Redefined to fit local practice, such distinctions may prove helpful. Some cultural, uh, some cultural misunderstanding. Skeptics might say that I'm taking an epistemological sledgehammer to crack a peanut. Surprisingly, even illustrious scholars fail to appreciate cultural styles of argument, be they reasoning or presuppositions. An elementary error in applying Western criteria of judgment to others. Uh, in the Balinese village, Hildred Geertz wrote about Balinese village assemblies, where most major decision, community decisions are taken. See, it's Quaker-like. Everybody agrees. A cursory inspection might appear to bear her out, but her interpretation is profoundly misleading. Just because you don't shout or flatly contradict someone in public meetings, it does not follow people are not arguing nor that decisions are reached by unanimous agreement. Having studied such assemblies as a member over two years, I learned how arguments are framed and answered. Much skill goes into how you phrase argument and disagreement, and when losing, how to withdraw to fight another day. Anyone who's been in a big department knows the politics of this. It's Different factions make their cases through skilled orators who are adept at culturally approved styles of reasoning, logos, and who know how to motivate and move audiences, pathos. Appealing to widows, the poor, and so on is a, is a, a classical move. Far from being Quaker-like, the decisions of such meetings can literally be matters of life or death. Banjar in the past used to pass death sentences if they got really fed up with someone. Right, the second example. I couldn't go without a reference to Clifford Geertz, could I? Uh, Clifford Geertz's description of Bali as a theater state is a wonderful image. Bali was a theater state in which the kings and princes were the impresarios, the priests, the directors, and the peasants, the supporting cast, the stage crew, and audiences. The stupendous cremations, tooth filings, temple dedications, pilgrimages, and blood sacrifices, mobilizing hundreds and even thousands of people and great quantities of wealth, were not means to political ends. They were the ends themselves. They were what the state was for. Court ceremonialism was the driving force of court politics. A mass ritual was not a device to shore up the state, but rather the state. Even its final gasp was a device for the enactment of mass ritual. Power served pomp, not pomp power. The ritual life of the court, and in fact the life of the court generally, is thus paradigmatic, not merely reflective of social order. Sadly, 
this bears little relationship to reality. And there was, uh, somebody asked me about this um, work of Margaret Wiener on visible and invisible realms who wrote a counter account based upon what uh, elderly people had said about the mass, uh, the mass suicides of Bo uh, Balinese royalty in front of the Dutch in 1906-1908. It was a brilliant account and uh, disagreed with Geertz at every single point. It took her years to get a job in the States because Geertz didn't want somebody who was going to disagree with everything that he'd written. <laughs> How exactly do you establish how much power a ruler has, short of going to war? Great ceremonies with the acid test. Could you persuade your lords and subjects to turn up? Quite often not. Successfully pulling off a major spectacle was an exercise in pathos. It was convincing. An argument, as argument, it was very convincing indeed. Geertz was either being naive, disingenuous, or Eurocentric. Spectacular rites did not happen by themselves, but require planning, decision-making, negotiation, and persuasion. Every strep, a step in royal strategy involved reflection, innumerable discussions and meetings before taking action. To reach his interpretation, Geertz ignored, or did not know, that by any standards, Balinese were remarkably warlike. Besides running much of the slave trade from eastern Indonesia for centuries, the nine states within Bali were at war with one another and outsiders for much of the time. Few rhetorical devices are as effective and deceptive as a good metaphor. The theater state is one. Geertz used a modern Western bourgeois idea of theater, which is entirely alien to Balinese understandings. That's what I mean about double discursivity. It's breach, rather. Theatre in Bali has quite different functions. Geertz orientalized Bali by not recognizing the role of argument in Balinese politics and by imposing a metaphor that entailed quite different presuppositions from those Balinese worked with. Another famous or infamous case is Margaret Mead's analysis of the cultural implications of child-rearing practices. These she saw as key to Balinese psychodynamics and obsession with ritual, why they went into trance and why they avoided climax at all costs. Inferring from photographs of mothers and children, Me drew generalizations about how culture shaped Balinese personality. Alternately stimulating, then ignoring a child was axiomatic to understanding how Balinese was systematically denied emotional response. Mead looked upon Balinese as laboratory specimens whose behavior was to be documented scientifically. Here is the other side of it, um, uh, how Balinese imagine Mead and uh, Bateson at work. By the way, uh, Mead wins two prizes for cultural insensitivity. The first is she, went around, she had flaming red hair and went around dressed in black with a big stick, which is the image of Chalon Aran, the famous witch. So she thought the Balinese were a bit odd and frightened because they ran away from her. I mean, it was the first time they'd ever actually seen a witch in life. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is she arrived in Bali on the day of Nyupi, the day of silence when nobody is permitted to travel. And she hired a car and drove straight across Bali, breaking every Balinese rule imaginable. So, um, and there are more, but I shall stop there. She's dead and she can't fight back. Fifty years later, two psychiatrists reviewed Mead's findings. Now, they did something sensible. They spoke to the mother concerned and asked her what she was doing. Oh, no, you don't ask a laboratory rat what it's doing, but uh, you can ask humans. And uh, she said she was expecting a second child. She was training the elder one. He could no longer have her undivided attention. Sounds reasonable to me. It had never occurred to Mead that her laboratory <coughs> specimens might reason about what they were doing. In refusing to treat Balinese as capable of reflexive argument, Mead imposed an explanation unsupported by her own visual evidence. It is not coincidental that some of the most famous anthropological truths arose from their author's failure to engage with or bother to find out about how their subjects argue. All right, finally, on to cultural styles of argument. Much argument in, da in Balinese daily life is verbal, however politely phrased. Religious assembly meetings are good examples. However, it would take a lot of time um, to, uh, uh, to give examples here. Um, I, on the written version, I uh, do indicate some. It's unwise to think of example of argument as necessarily involving explicit disagreement or even words. 
as styles of arguing inflected culturally, you have to learn to appreciate them. Two quite different examples may make the point. The case of the irritating underpants, it's one of my favorite titles, could be from um, Perry Mason. During the Japanese occupation of Bali in World War II, there was a grave material hardship. In my research village, the headman, backed by the court and a small coterie of high caste and rich villagers, ensured they had the lion's share of available rations, including cotton. Ordinary villagers were forced to use bark cloth. One villager, Dutmara, who I talk to later about this, found bark cloth uh, underpants irritating, literally. Arguing the case uh, publicly proved fruitless. So he managed to wangle a permit for 15 meters of cloth, five red, five white, and blue. The significance will become clear in a moment. Early one afternoon, he proceeded slowly towards the main square, trailing the cloth behind him on the ground as a large crowd gradually gathered. Arriving in front of the court, he sat at a food stall and ordered a coffee. The event crystallized opposition to the court, which lost control of the village and its wider ro role in local politics irrevocably. Not a word was said, but the cultural argument was rich. Cloth worn by a low caste person, doubly so trailed along the ground, was too polluting to be worn by high castes. And the three colors indicated the, three, uh, the high caste, three wangs, or three one of three colors. You can express Katut Mara's action syllogistically, but it doesn't match the visual impact. Villagers insisted on telling me the story some 30 years later with great amusement. It was uh, an enjoyable moment. The second example is the exile of the Pandawa. That's the five uh, brothers uh, from the Mahabharata. In 1991, um, as usual, a van full of villagers came to collect me from the airport. On the journey home, they insisted on telling me about a dance drama, Sundratari, recently broadcast as part of the International Bali Arts Festival. Sundratari are dance drama spectacles, which are distinctive in that the mime, uh, dancers mime to the voice of a select, single dalang puppeteer. It was a form ideally suited to the monologic inclinations of the New Order regime. Senior political figures spoke, and everybody else was obliged to listen passively. What form seems less suited to argument? The, ep the episode in question was from the Mahabharata when the Pandawa brothers have been condemned to exile in the forest. Before they leave, the sage Bhagavan Vyasa advises them on the proper conduct of rulers Having instructed them always to be honest and just in thoughts and words and actions, he added, and I will read this, if you are a leader of a people, if you rule over them, you cannot live too well. You must not have too luxurious a lifestyle, but should live simply. You are such a leader. Now none of your subjects should be allowed to be corrupt. That is what you must command. But this must, be take, uh, this must be seriously observed in practice. It should not take the form of words. You order the masses to obey, but then it turns out you did not do so yourself. That is the difficulty of becoming a ruler. It is easy to give orders. It is hard to put them into practice. That is the first thing to grasp. When a ruler is not honest, the world goes to rot. No way may you do that. This is what it is to be just. You have to strive to be fair and just to all your subjects. I'll just give you a short video clip to show you what the actuality was. <coughs> So, okay, I didn't make it up. <laughs> it looks like a conventional moral story. But that was not how the mature spectators understood it. The Dalang had engaged in an elegant sasimbing, an indirect criticism in which the ostensible and intended targets are quite different. The villagers treated it as a blistering but carefully modulated indictment of President Suharto, 
and family, as well as the then governor of Bali, who was notoriously corrupt. Its cleverness lay in being an exemplary moral example. It was up to the spectators how to interpret it. Argument lies in the relationship between the speaker and spectators on an occasion. Unlike contemporary Europe, Balinese understand agency as lying more with whom a performance is for than with the creator. We like to think of the agent, as uh, the, the writer or the director of a film or whatever, as the agent and everybody else as passive. Balinese reverse it. The, the scribe for a text was relatively unimportant. It was who it was for and how it was received. Now, this point is something that uh, actors and dalangs, puppeteers in Bali, are fully aware of. It would be unwise to forget the many considerations, including the role of brute coercion and threats, in creating the illusion of Asian values. Right, to sum up, what have I been trying to say and what not? First, I'm not arguing that disciplinary paradigms are irrelevant. If knowledge is for a purpose, and if you're after critical understanding, you need to question the presuppositions and practices of these paradigms. This includes interrogating the practices of intellectuals themselves, something we rarely do. So you're, you can turn your example on what are my practices in this. That's equally part of the discussion. These two aims of research, uh, knowledge are antithetical. For example, mass communications research, in no, small, uh, in no small part funded by industry, works with an implausible transmission model of information that its founders explicitly disavowed. It uses a model of audiences that is frankly laughable. However, it produced the kinds of findings that suit industry, government, and the prof professoriate who ensure its continuity. Mass media academics mostly applauded the rise of social media as liberating ordinary citizens to become, that dreadful word, prosumers, consumers and producers at the same time. Often, they uncritically e echo the advertising blurb of the telecommunications corporations in reiterating European techno-utopianism. They ignored, or were ignorant of, arguments about new technologies creating new modes of power knowledge that allowed new modes of surveillance, control, and dissimulation. Then came fake news. So everybody now says the opposite of what they said five years ago. Disciplines are not monoliths. In my terms, they comprise a range of different, even incompatible practices. Some work, uh, some work is quite outstanding, some dire. What makes the difference? Broadly, insofar as research engages with how the subjects of study live, think, and argue, it can be revelatory and open, and open up previously unimagined possibilities. Insofar as research relies on familiar, often Eurocentric, metaphors and models, it tends to be predictable, boring, unilluminating, and reassert prevailing hegemonies. What then, if anything, is so special about argument? It's not just the shift from structure and system to process and practice. It disaggregates the engineered products of articulation from its constitutive practices. It asks who represented what as what, to whom, on what occasion, for what purpose. In so doing, it exposes how and for what purposes hegemony is articulated in any instance. Approach to articulatory practices, society and culture seal, cease to be unitary wholes or social imaginaries. They become sites of struggle, articulated around ethnic, class, gender, religious, generational, and other differences. There is, of course, a major academic industry busily denying the, uh, such differences. That is mass communication's role in generating endless quantitative data in, to use Yanang's neat phrase, desperately seeking the audience. Argument enables us not just to understand how our subjects imagine the world, but to appreciate the criteria they use in judging events and actions. The scholar's task is to understand the subject's lived world quite separate from its academic explication. If that's what studying argument encourages, then I think it's eminently desirable. I do not know about you.